Hello, Tiffany Roysland from the ELL department. Just answering a quick question today that we've gotten a few times this year, and we know that when one person has a question, that usually means that there are more people that have the same question and just haven't asked. And so we just want to talk a little bit today about alternative assessments. And what does that mean when we say that ELLs have the right to alternative assessments? And so first of all, we should probably clear up um, the difference between modifications and accommodations because people use those terms interchangeably, but they're actually different. Uh, modifications means you are changing the content expectations, what, what you are teaching or what you are expecting them to know. Um, an accommodation does not change the expectations of content, it just makes it um, more accessible for a student. So for example, if a student wears glasses, you would let that student wear glasses in your class. You don't change what you're teaching, you're just allowing him to even the playing field. And so when we talk about alternative assessments, we're not saying give them a free pass. We're not saying um, lower your expectations. We're saying make the content understandable so that the ELL student has a level playing field and can try to learn what it is you are asking them to learn. Uh, as I talk, I would like for you to picture that you moved your family to France. You had this great opportunity, so you moved the family to France. You got your kids enrolled in public schools because we're teachers, we can't afford a private a European education. So your kid is in a public school and they are learning French. And the first year it's going really well. They come home every day, they're excited, they're learning, it's very good. But the second year they get pushed out of their happy little uh, French classes and they're off into the wider school and they have to learn alongside uh, their peers who have been speaking this language, writing in this language their entire lives. How do you think your son or daughter would feel? Stressed? Confused? Maybe like giving up? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about leveling the playing field. We're not asking for a free ride. We're asking you to help a student understand what it is you're talking about. Understand how to give you an answer so they can show you what they know. So the first thing I would suggest when you are making an accommodation on a test is to look at your KUDs. What are the essential understandings? What is it that the kids need to know? And if there's anything on your test that is not in your KUDs, get rid of it. If it was an interesting class discussion or it was something fun that was in the reading, if it's not part of your KUDs, get rid of it. Partially because it takes an English learner so long to read the test and to translate it in their head as they're reading that it's just gonna take them forever. So if you can get rid of anything that's not essential, that would be fantastic. The second thing I would recommend is to go through, and if it's a multiple choice test, eliminate some of the answers. If you've got four choices, narrow it down to three so they don't have to read so much. Again, you're, you're not lowering your expectations of what they need to know, you're just lessening the language demands on that test. I would also advise on a multiple choice test, um, we sometimes think it's fun to kind of throw in a freebie or a funny one. So for example, um, who was the president during World War II? And you give three plausible answers and for number four, you put Donald Trump. An ELL student doesn't get that that is a joke or that D is not a legitimate answer because they saw president of the United States and Donald Trump. And so for them, that is a legitimate choice and they may choose it just because they know who that is. They've heard that name. So get rid of any of those little jokes, anything that you think um, any kid would know that that's not a right answer. Yeah, ELL students do not get that humor. <laughs> so just get rid of anything that is not um, essential. Don't have that as an option. Second, I would ask you to look at your test and see if the student is reading at say a third, fourth, fifth grade level, right? Think back to your kid, now you're studying in France. Could your son or daughter understand this in a second language? We use big words naturally, right? We're educators, we're educated. And so we use big words. Can you ask the questions using fewer words, making it more simple? Again, you're not reducing the content. We're not asking you to um, change what it is that they need to know. It's just, can you ask it in a more simple way? Um, on short answer questions and essay questions, I borrowed one of Stacy's tests for world history so I can show you a great example of what we mean by um, providing sentence frames. So she has an essay 
question or short answer here where she's asking her students to do a lot of things. Four sentences here, two sentences here, four sentences here. And an ELL student is really going to struggle with how to formulate that answer. That's asking for a lot all at one time. And so you can see here in her modified assessment, she's got what we call sentence frames. So she has given them the start of the sentence. And then when she wants more information, she continues there. This, again, it's not narrowing your expectations, lowering your expectations. It's giving students a chance to understand what you want from them so they can give you a better answer. They are trying really hard. I shouldn't say that for everyone. There's always an exception to the rule, but a lot of our students are trying so hard, but if they can't understand the question and they don't know how to formulate an answer, it's going to be very difficult for them. Another example here that Stacy had on her test, um, she asked students to answer four of nine questions. And on the regular test, they were all just kind of listed. And on her modified test, she gave the nine choices, again, with sentence frames, so they could um, have a better chance at answering those questions. And again, not lowering expectations, just giving them a way to answer that they can understand. Um, even just breaking a, a question down into two parts, we don't think about it because again, we just naturally ask these questions. But if you ask something like, define irony and give an example, that's actually two questions. And so to make it simpler for an EL student, just break it down into two questions. Number one, what is irony? Number two, give an example of irony. And that seems um, like not a lot of hard work, but when you think about somebody who's learning a second language, that would be really, really helpful. Um, a couple of other things that you should know about testing. They have the right to extended time. And when they say, I can't stay after school because I ride the bus, that is probably true. A lot of our students depend on busing and don't um, have another way to get home. Uh, at West, they had the city bus that was an option if they needed to take the city bus home after school, but we don't have city buses that come out past our school. And so really take advantage of AFT time, or if you have a prep that you would be willing to let them come in and continue working, um, you can talk with them about that. They have the right to have the test read aloud if they need that. And so that's a little harder to coordinate, but we are happy to work with you on that if you need the test read aloud. Um, they have the right to a word-to-word -word dictionary. Much like we um, teach the verbiage, secure your phone, we teach ELLs to say, may I use my phone to translate? And that's great um, in normal circumstances, but on a test, you may not want them using their phone just in case they're tempted to Google an answer. So we have in the ELL rooms, word-to-word uh, -word dictionaries where you simply look up a word and it says that word in French or in Spanish or in Arabic or whatever language the student needs. So if you know that you have a test coming up, you can just email us and we can send a student with whatever copies, whatever languages you need to your room. So they have something, it doesn't give away any answers. It just, um, in case a word that um, is in the question is not understandable to them, they can just look up that word in their first language to try to help them understand. And finally, um, retakes are allowed, but I would ask, please don't just give a student a retake without some sort of reteaching, because if they didn't get it the first time, the test is not going to be any different if they just take it again a second time without working with you in any way. And again, if you can use that AFT time, that would be fantastic. Now, if they um, bomb, <laughs> if it just goes really, really badly, we need to ask ourselves a couple of questions. First of all, did I make the test comprehensible? And, um, and if you think you did a really good job accommodating that, accommodating, making those changes on that test, then maybe we need to also look at, did we teach it well? And I am just as guilty of this. I know I kind of get in my rhythm and I am not, not thinking about um, lessening those language demands sometimes. And so just a few things to think about if you're concerned that sometimes your ELL students are not getting the grades that you think they should or that you wish they would. Um, some great things to give students are chapter summaries or outlines. It is very, very difficult for them to read academic text. Um, if you have children, you started out reading like rhyming books like Dr. Seuss, right? And after that, then you jump to a biology textbook? No, right? <laughs> and so we're asking kids who read at the level of you know, a fourth grader to pick up a textbook that is this thick and to try to understand what is being said, and they just cannot. And so 
can you do a summary or can you do an outline? If you do slideshows like on Google Slideshow or PowerPoint, could you print those slides and give it to the student at the start of the unit or the start of the chapter or whatever so they can look at it um, before you give the lecture, try to understand what it is before they hear it, try to read it and hear it. They can also take notes right on there. Um, that's easier. We always say, you know, if it's on the board, it's on the test. So if it's, if it's really important, they could use that paper to take notes and to help themselves with that. Um, I would also ask that you try to incorporate some more activities. I can show you a great graphic, a chart of how much students learn based on whether they hear it or they see it or whatever. Hearing um, only 20% of what students hear sinks in. And so if you will do the, the lecture along with an activity, it jumps to 80%, from 20% retention to 80% retention. So if you can just pause your lecture to say, hey, turn to your neighbor and discuss, what do you think was the reason for this? Or what do you think will happen? Something like that. Just having an opportunity to talk sinks it in a lot more than just listening. So could you incorporate more activities into your teaching that give a chance, give students a chance to talk? Um, simplified instructions. That's hard, I know, but we're, you know, we just kind of rattle off what we want them to do, but could we make it a little simpler? Again, sentence frames, like I showed you on Stacy's test, those sentence frames on the test, you could do that for homework too, and you'd probably get much better answers. Um, and then teaching vocabulary. We sometimes assume that kids know what we're talking about and they have no idea what the vocabulary is. So those are just a few ideas. We are very, very happy to work with you on anything else that you need. I know it takes a lot of time. Um, I would highly recommend if you have a department with more than one person teaching what you do, sorry, Beth or Jenny or Micah or anybody else who's the equivalent of a one-man band, you have to do this on your own, I'm sorry. But if you have, say, three teachers teaching Earth and Space Science or three teaching Biology, if you can divide and conquer, so I take Chapter 1, you take Chapter 2, you take Chapter 3, and then share those modif those uh, all the accommodations that you're doing, that would be um, a lot less work for you and for your colleagues. And that would be great for all of our students. And then if you can find some way to save that from year to year, if you've got a shared folder of some sort, that would be really helpful. Um, there is a module, I know you guys love these ELL modules that we started last year. There is a module coming up this winter about uh, testing and modifications versus accommodations and things like that. So we will be talking more about it at length in the winter, but I just wanted to give you a quick little synopsis of what we mean. Um, and please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you so much for listening and have a lovely day.